This is just such a beautiful opportunity to share one of my favorite workshops, Awaken Living. I've given it for years to hundreds of people and was inspired by my team and spirit to make it public. But what a beautiful way to launch this by doing it live with all of you and for a beautiful purpose. Beth, have you found Jen yet? I found Jen and she should be coming in as a panelist right now. Very good. All right. So I'm going to be sharing my screen throughout this workshop. And so I'll just be a little uh, thumbnail up in your corner. I have slides to share. It's a slideshow with lots of talking. I won't be taking questions. If we have some time at the end, I may do that. But for now, it's just a lot of information to share with you. And it's one of my favorite topics. It's all about who and what we are, why we're here, how to find more peace in our life by a simple change of perspective, how to raise our consciousness and come into more alignment with who we really are. So I'm going to first bring up the first slide here is that to get us kicked off just right. So Bev, how's that look? Looks good. Fills the screen? Okay, mm -hmm. excellent. So, ben, what's that, Bev? Oh, and Jen is, is here on screen, if oh, you're very good. ready. So let me just pull up, when we're talking about Jen, Jen is Jennifer Dulski, and she is the founder and head honcho of Always and Forever Animal what is the real name? Animal sanctuary. I'm getting a mind. Sanctuary. Animal sanctuary. <laughs> there we go. Let's bring Bev. Uh, Bev, let's bring Jen in if we can bring her on camera. She she is on screen, Suzanne. On screen. Well, then I'm going to change the get out of stop share and go to that view. There's Jen. Hi, Jen. Hi, how are you? Good. So I uh, had the great honor and pleasure of going to Jen's beautiful animal sanctuary dog hospice is what I call it in person with my husband Ty and both of us were in tears from the love that radiates from this beautiful sanctuary you've created. I'd love to spend a lot of time telling people about it but we don't have that time today so I want to encourage everyone to visit your website. What's the best way to get there? Always and forever F-U-R-E-V-E-R -E -E dot love, L-O-V-E. Oh, so. how perfect is that? Always and forever dot love. And I know Bev will put that in big letters across the final mm -hmm. video here. But I want to thank everyone who's joined together today for this live event because they could have waited and watched it for free on YouTube, but they chose to join us live today to share in the energy, to share in the love, and to share their abundance with you and the dogs and all of your volunteers. So when this is over, the money's still coming in a little bit, but I can tell you that we are going to write a check on behalf of everyone who donated for $13,000. Yay. Um, that's <laughs> phenomenal. I, I can't even tell you. I, it's amazing when you run an organization off of faith. And I can tell you that God's timing is perfect and we absolutely needed this. We took in 70 animals in the last two weeks. Ooh. So 58 dogs and 12 or 18 cats. So um, every single dollar goes to the animals that nobody else wants, that are abandoned, that are left at kill shelters, or they need someone to love them. So I can, I can say that you truly have made a difference just by joining today. So from the bottom of all of our hearts, thank you so much. Um, it's it's humbling and, and wonderful. That's outstanding. And I know this video will be on YouTube for years. So for all of you watching it not live, it is never too late to donate to Always and Forever. They're always getting new animals in and no animal dies alone there. They die by natural causes there and always with a person to comfort them. It's the most incredible environment. We were just there again last month. Ty's crying, I'm crying because the love is immense. They take the dogs, like Jen said, that nobody wants, and the cats now. So $13,000, I hope it's just to start from this. And thank you, thank you, thank you to you and all of your volunteers for what you do. Thank you. All righty. Wonderful. Okay. So isn't that a great way to start? Do you all feel awesome? 
I'd like to start with an invocation to bring us all into one beautiful field of love so that you sit and bathe in that for the rest of this presentation. Let's us all join our hearts as one. Take a nice deep breath, close your eyes for a moment, get centered in the heart. As you exhale, let's release anything that doesn't serve us right now so that our vessels are clear, that our minds are centered, and that each person present and listening today hears exactly what they need to hear for their own soul's growth, that we may take whatever is gained today and share it with those around us and also to help us each find healing and peace and comfort and more love in our own individual lives, but also as a result of today to come to know that we are both individuals and one wholeness with so much gratitude for all of us for following the nudge to pay attention today and to be light workers. We just affirm we are so loved and there's so much gratitude for knowing this. Beautiful. All right. So thank you, Bev. We're gonna mm -hmm. get started now. And you should be seeing this first slide, right? The thank you slide? Yes. Okay. So the name of the presentation is Awake and Living. And what you see here is somebody sleeping on the job. <laughs> and that is an analogy for how most human beings are. And it's kind of discouraging to use the word most. But if we are to simply pick up a newspaper and read the headlines, it's pretty obvious that people are still not acting in a loving way on a global basis. We uh, hurt each other. We argue with each other. There's a lot of confrontation. And so this is said with no judgment, but simply an observation that we wouldn't hurt each other if we truly understood who we are. To be awakened means that you no longer identify with the part of you that walks around in a human suit as your main identity. You come to realize that you are both human and spirit at the same time. And there's so much freedom in realizing that because then we get to choose from moment to moment which perspective we're taking. Are we coming at this from strictly human or are we seeing with the eyes of the soul or a little mix of both? I hope you can feel as we get going here that this, this whole talk is coming from a higher level than just in the people suit. I give credit to Spirit, to my team in Spirit for the inspiration behind this talk. Now, those of you familiar with my background will know that for most of my life, my career, I wore a suit, a Navy uniform, and I identified very much with that role. And part of that role was just like this slideshow, seeing the world very much as black and white. But we know now that it's so much more than that and we get to choose how we view the world. I certainly wasn't asleep on the job as aide to the head of the United States military. Here I am shown here with the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff when I was his right-hand assistant traveling around the world with him. But I was sure asleep as to who I was on the inside at that time. I had no idea that we are souls temporarily in a body. My whole focus was on this human reality. In fact, if anyone had told me that I would be sitting one-on-one -on -one with people someday, connecting them with their loved ones who had passed working as a medium, I would have told them that they were crazy because it's not something I was aware of at all. I like to start with a little humor anytime I give a workshop. So I want to tell you a true story about when I went to a dentist while Ty and I were traveling around the country a couple of years ago. And these days I tell people readily that I'm a medium, but I wasn't really comfortable sharing that in the beginning. You know, I used to say, I, I'm not happy using the M word for medium. But I went to this dentist because I was having tooth pain. It wasn't my regular dentist because we were traveling. And I sit down in the chair and in comes this, this dentist and he looks at me and he says, so where are you from? And I told him. 
And he said, what do you do for work? And I surprised myself because I came right out and I said, I'm a medium. And so being you know, brave enough to announce it to a stranger like that, I was expecting him to come back with some kind of response, but his response was really quite comical. He made no reaction whatsoever. It was as if I hadn't even spoken. He just got on with his work and diagnosing, you know, tapping on my teeth, putting the ice on my teeth, the hot stuff on my teeth, took some x-rays and I thought, well, isn't that interesting? <laughs> okay, we'll just let that go. And after a few minutes of doing his job, he comes up and he says, well, I know what your problem is. And I said, okay, what is it? And he said, you have a cracked tooth. And I said, how do you know? And the dentist said, well, it's kind of like your work. I can't see it. <laughs> I can't prove it, but I know it's there. And suddenly I knew uh, this guy was on board. So this is the challenge that we have as human beings. We walk around and we don't realize that there is a greater reality. We see with the physical eyes, we depend on our tools. And if we use that as our only judgment of who we are and what reality is, then we miss out on a much greater reality. In this picture here, you see my stepdaughter, Susan, and she is the whole reason that I'm on this path. She was uh, struck and killed by lightning in 2006. And I can say that without crying anymore because she has proven to me beyond any doubt that she is still around, that she still exists, and she's one of my greatest teachers. And so not having been born a medium to now connect with Susan, which was my whole intention when I started on this spiritual path, I've connected with thousands and thousands of souls who've crossed and all with evidence to prove that this life is just one little parentheses in eternity, as author Joel Goldsmith called it. But the beautiful part about being a medium is that not only has, have I been aware now of the ability to connect with those across the veil, but I'm going to call it the fruits of the spirit are what have now become part of my daily life. And this is what I want to impart with all of you. You may not be mediums. I know that some of you are, and some of you are student mediums, but who wouldn't love to connect with your loved ones who have passed? These, this connection with spirit is one of the fruits of the spirit. What are we talking about here? The results of what happens when we step out of our day-to-day -day way of being and raise our consciousness, come into alignment with who we really are and look at some of these aspects here on this slide. I know that one of my greatest challenges when I came into this life to work on was patience and I have so much more now. I'm not completely there yet, but uh, joy and peace are the results when we raise our consciousness. I've mentioned several times already that people want to know who they are and why are we here. In fact, what is my purpose is the number one question that people ask transformational teachers. What is my purpose? And the answer is very clear. You are here to turn up your inner light. You are the light. There is a light within you that never goes out. It's what nudged you to join us today. It's this evolutionary impulse within us is the light that flows through all that is. And the more you turn it up, the more joy you feel in your life, no matter what's going on in your life. So this is why I wanted to have this workshop now because there's so much divisiveness in our world. There's a lot of uncertainty and fear. And when you realize who you really are, that changes everything. So coming to know that there is this light, and of course, that's just a word. It's a metaphor for the power that breathes you. It's a metaphor for the force that underlies all that is. 
when you come to realize that this power, this force, this source, this light is you at your very deepest essence, and it never goes out, why then our greatest desire becomes to learn how do I turn it up more in every moment. And we call that enlightenment. And I believe that none of us are ever truly and fully enlightened while we're in a body. In fact, I, I hesitate. I've heard certain people say, I'm enlightened. And I just inside say, hmm, I'm not so sure then if we feel we have to share that with others, because that sounds like a little bit of an ego thing. When enlightenment is truly ongoing, it's like a dimmer switch that we get to turn up. And I've been told by my team, our physical bodies cannot handle the fullness of the light that exists. I know I have literally been knocked out of my chair when channeling my guides, when they brought in the full force of the energy, the light that they carry. I was fried for the rest of the evening, literally by that light. And so it's a good thing that we're not fully enlightened, but oh, as you turn it up, the joy that ensues from that is a joy that passes all understanding and the peace as well. So I'm often asked by people, you know, how do I make a difference? You, the questioner, how do I make one difference in this world? Can, can little me make a difference? Absolutely. When you look at it yourself as a light, I love this graphic for that purpose. The lights around you will become brighter by you shining your light better, brighter. And the word service is on here because that's one of the greatest ways to turn up our light is in helping others in any way. As our light shines brighter, it's infectious. What a great thing to have go viral, right? So everybody that's joined in today, hundreds of us right now are making this glow around the world that's seen by those in the spirit world. My guides, I got goosebumps right now validating that this is the effect that we have just by our sheer intention to make a difference in the world. And it's not each person, we, we don't have to have the majority of the people in the world shining brightly to tip the scales. This energy, the light that we shine is so intense that even if a small core of us turn our light work, lights up and serve as light workers, we do affect all those around us and help us them to raise their light as well. I have to tell you that my husband, Ty, a retired destroyer captain, is very new to all of this uh, spiritual teaching. And one day I came home from a conference when I was very new on the path. If you've read my book, Messages of Hope, you know this story. But I came home and I said, Ty, I've been invited to speak at a light workers conference in Chicago. And he says, well, that's interesting. And I said, yeah, but I don't know if I should go because um, we've just started on this and they're, they're not going to pay my transportation there. They're not going to pay my hotel. There's no uh, honorarium. So uh, I, I want to make a difference, but I don't want to go in the red doing it. And he said, well, Suzanne, I'm behind you 100%. Whatever you decide, I'm with you. So I went into meditation. I asked my team. And I came back to Ty and I said, honey, I've decided just to wait and, uh, and there will be other opportunities. And he said, well, you know, sweetheart, I think that's a good idea. Because really, I couldn't understand why you'd want to go speak to a bunch of electricians anyway. <laughs> and I said, no, honey, it's not the light workers union. And I had to explain to him that a light worker is anyone whose goal and intention and greatest desire is to help all of us find the light inside and turn it up. So I know that I am definitely speaking to light workers now. So most of my teaching, if I want to get back to the very basics, is centered on what I call the awakened way. And it's simply a way of living. It's not a, uh, any one set of rules, but it does have certain principles that I can always fall back on when I might get out of balance. Or if somebody asks me a spiritual question, I go back to the three main principles of the awakened way and it applies to any situation. 
And so we will be talking about the awakened way and those three principles as we go through this. But for now, I do want to define what we're talking about when we talk about the difference between being awake and asleep, spiritually, in awareness. So somebody who is awake is aware that everything that exists is a manifestation and expression of one consciousness, one field of energy, one sea of love. Words are so, so limiting, but that's the wholeness. We are both a finite human being and fully complete already as part of the one light. When you really understand that, you're awake spiritually. If you're asleep, all you see is the dualism, the separation. You're not aware of something called the soul. There's nothing wrong with this. I spent 47 years of my life in duality consciousness and I got along just fine. I had a successful career. Many of you will identify with this, but something's missing. It was like a big cold pit in my heart. I felt separate from other people. I felt alone. I experienced a lot of fear. There was doubt and uncertainty about the future. That's being asleep and it doesn't feel very good. How about this quote though for feeling good? This is from Yogananda. Many of you may have read Autobiography of a Yogi or Yogi, yeah, by Yogananda. And this quote from him is beautiful. The man of self-realization, meaning the human being who knows he or she is an expression of spirit, knows a bliss that cannot be compared to anything in this world. It is an incomparable happiness that cannot be described in words. And I feel that bubbling up right now, and I hope that you can feel it as well, coming across the waves as I send it to all of your hearts as you listen to this, as you feel these words. Some of you may even feel the need to cry at times with things that are said today. That's the soul saying, yes, now you remember. And that's the happiness we're talking about, the underlying joy of the soul. And that's what self-realization is. Notice the capital S, where there's only one self that divides itself into seven and a half billion smaller selves that we call human beings. But each of those individual lights is spiritually evolving. That's Part of the reason we're here. In other words, each of those individual lights is turning itself up to match ultimately, which we can't do while in a physical body, the ultimate light. And so you have people in various stages of awakening. So this is a little very linear left brain chart, right? We have wispy right brain charts of spirit. And here's one that appeals to the left brain to talk about the difference between the, those who are asleep and those who are awake. And you can see on the bottom words that would describe those who are asleep, they see the world as hopeless, sad, frightening, or frustrating, and they feel themselves to be powerless victims. Now, it's very important to understand, see the line in the middle. There's a dividing line between those who are asleep and those who are awake. This is not cut and set in stone. We, in our human costumes, go back and forth across this line even after we awaken to the truth of who we are. So if you find yourself these days, you read the headlines and you feel yourself feeling frustrated, making judgments, feeling hopeless, sad, or frightened, once you're awakened, you catch yourself and you say, wait, that's only part of the reality. There's another whole reality and using awareness, the power within, the light within, you turn up the light and you cross that line to being aware and awake. And you can feel the difference here. Those who are awake see life as exciting, challenging, and stimulating. And they know that love comes from within. 
It's not dependent on what's in the headlines, who's in your immediate environments, who's in your life. It is self-generated because that love is the light that never goes out. So don't be worried if you have given in to the fear and the frustration in the news lately. Just be aware there is a better way, a higher perspective. And the more you awaken and set that as your intention to remain above the sleeping line, the more that becomes your reality. Raise your hand on the bottom of the screen. You can do this at any time and just say, raise your hand if I'm all in. I want to stay awake. Yeah, I love that. Look at the number. Zoom. We're all in this together, and that's why we're here. All right. Then when that number stops climbing, you can just close that, okay? <laughs> love to see that. Thank you for sharing that energy with us. So the, the really cool thing is why I said that none of us is fully enlightened yet, because it's a journey. I hope I have a lot more learning to go. I know I do when I see certain human behaviors in myself. And so look at this. Now we have the awakening to sleep line down at the bottom of this slide. And so some people have just come to the realization through something that happened in their life, some kind of awakening of the fact that there is a greater reality, that we are multidimensional beings. And so maybe you just have one eye open, like you wake up in the morning, you're still a little sleepy, but I'm looking around and saying, hmm, this is a whole nother reality than the one I've been living in until now. And the more you set the intention to raise your consciousness and work this spiritual path, now both eyes are open, you are still awake, but maybe still a little groggy and you slip back across that line to being a sleepy human being and acting very human in a not so positive way, coming out of alignment with the true self a little too often. So you just keep that commitment to your path going and aim to be fully awakened. You can be fully awakened in this lifetime. Don't get me wrong about that, but we do sometimes fall asleep. The goal is to just keep the lessons coming as painlessly as possible and realize this is the school of life and we are here for the purpose of enjoying our classes. I, want, I said it that way because in the past, I bought into the belief that it's the school of life and we came here to learn lessons. And I went back to school and there are tests, right? Tests. Well, how about if we saw this school of life like art school or cooking school and we're experimenting all the time and we're seeing what new and beautiful creations we can make in this school. And there may be tests and they may be challenging but it's not for punishment and it's not something we have to do. We made a choice to come to this school. So why don't we make the most of it? And just like in college, you have different levels. See these lines? Once you've crossed the line, that thick line at the bottom from being asleep to awake, it's like the bottom of it would be the 101 college level and then 201, 301, 401. The more you start to realize that love is created within, well, you're now already beyond the, the freshman classes. You realize that nobody else can make you happy. It's your thoughts that do that. And you start to experience more and more as you rise to the upper levels of being awake, the love and the joy and the compassion that come from being awake. And this in the highest levels of being awakened brings about true happiness. It's a happiness that's there beneath anything that's going on in this world. Who wants some of that? I wake up each morning with a sense of wonder, with a sense, I see the hands going up. Yes, indeed. With a sense of excitement because miracles meaning the other side, the greater reality, our soul nature shows itself in an ongoing manner every day when we remain awake. And when I fall asleep, I'm so quickly aware of it when I fall asleep spiritually and act very human because it feels so dissonant, so different than these higher states. 
So that's my goal for all of us, that all of us will come to, to graduate from the lower levels of awakening to, I hope that everybody here in this class has already tasted what it feels like to cross from being asleep to awake and then move from the basic to the advanced stuff. Ah, I want to take a break a second and just stop the sharing. How are we doing, Bev? Whoops. Great. <laughs> you turned the camera off, huh? <laughs> I, I did, and I, uh, I, I muted it. So. Bev, are you asleep? <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. I just oh, okay. think you better not be sleeping in the no, background. No, no. <laughs> I'm watching the chat box. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Bev is a lovely, lovely assistant. All right. So I just wanted to take a breath there. I'm so loving the energy that I'm feeling from all of you. So let's continue here. All right, here we go. So, whoa, hang on a sec. There we go. Next slide. So just the fact that you are participating in this video or watching this, this, this workshop shows that you are more committed to change and making the higher choices that an awakened soul makes. Actually, that's, my guys just caught me and said, not the right wording. The soul is awake. It's the human being who's asleep. So they said, not an awakened soul, an awakened human being. So that's our goal, to balance the human side with the soul that is always awake. So how do we come to this awareness of who we are? Some of you have known it your whole life. Wow, what a blessing that would have been for most of us when we go through the challenges that are inevitable when we take on these roles in human costumes. For me, the wake up call was something that I never would have knowingly asked for at a human level. And that's the way it is for so many of you who are part of my community. So many of you have come to know my work because someone near and dear to you has passed to the other side, but something in you knew that they can't possibly be gone forever and they're not. And so as you come to know, perhaps you've had a reading with me or with another medium, perhaps so you've had signs from your loved one and you said, wait a minute, this couldn't happen if we're only these limited humans and that death is not the end. There must be more, there must be greater dimensions and there are. That tragedy turns up to be a blessing when it serves as a wake up call for you on your path. And then if you're like me, you just can't get enough of this feeling. You can't follow enough that nudge to, to bring in more, to express more of the power that's flowing through us. That light in the form of a lightning bolt that took my Susan has now come to totally transform my life. And I, I hope that none of you needs a bolt out of the blue to wake you up. But when we can see the silver lining in that, that leads us to have the personal experience of being the light. And that's my goal for you. I'm sharing teaching with you today. We're looking at pictures. We're thinking about these things, but nothing will awaken you to the truth of who you are more than the personal experience of that light welling up inside of you, radiating outwards. Just do it right now. Move your awareness to the heart and realize you control that brightness. Just send it out in 360 degrees to all of us listening and then to all of our extended families, knowing that doing that heals the world. Doesn't that feel amazing? I know that hearing stories of the greater reality, by the way, thank you for that. It was amazing. Hearing stories of the greater reality is one of the quickest ways to show us the first principle of the awakened way. And that is that you are a beautiful soul existing in multiple realities at once. You don't become a soul when you pass. You are a soul now that has a body for a while, okay? So one of my greatest ways to give you an experience of that is to share stories. So throughout this workshop, I'm gonna share some of my favorite stories from readings, just so that this is not all just theory. 
this is reality, that there is a non-physical reality and we can tap into it simply by shifting our focus. So let me introduce you to this wonderful gentleman here. His name is Bill Hammond and some of you know Bill. A few of you are in a group that he belongs to. And Bill was my original literary agent. He's retired from that now, but he is an author in his own right. And he wrote a bunch of uh, nautical books, the Cutler Family Chronicles. And so he was surprised when I reached out to him that a former Navy officer, me, would be writing about mediumship. But Bill Hammond is the man who helped me get a contract with Hay House, a wonderful publishing company that does self-transformational books. He helped me get my first metaphysical book, The Priest and the Medium, published by Hay House. So I got to know Bill in person and uh, we try, Ty and I traveled to meet him in his town when he was living in Minneapolis. Here you see me with Bill standing next to our RV and these are his two sons, Harrison and Churchill, behind him. But that's not his wife beside me, that's his sister, Chris. The person who's missing in this photo is Bill's wife, Victoria. I briefly met Victoria on a previous visit to Minneapolis, but I didn't get to know her at, at all. But when Bill reached out to me one, uh, one awful day to let me know that his wife, Victoria, had cancer, I was just, just hurting for him. I knew that he had a relationship like I have with my husband, Ty, and he really, you know, prayed for a miracle, but sometimes the miracles happen after somebody passes. Sometimes healing is not supposed to happen. We don't have the bigger picture here. And when I got the call that Victoria had passed, I burst into tears. I had such a connection with Bill at the heart level that I don't normally cry when I hear about passings, but I could feel the depths of his pain. And what really stunned me is when Bill told me that he read my book, Messages of Hope, to Victoria in hospice. They shared it together. And I remember when Bill took my manuscript for the priest and the medium. He had no understanding of mediumship. He kept trying to correct me when I said that we are souls here and now. And he said, no, Suzanne, I think you're wrong about that. And I said, no, Bill, trust me, leave it as is. And he ended up uh, believing as a result of asking for a reading after Victoria passed. He in fact asked me to do that reading for him on his birthday. He said he could think of no greater gift and to connect with his beloved Victoria on his birthday. So this was way back in 2009. I was brand new to doing readings and very nervous because I knew how important this was to him. But I need not have worried because I remember it was a phone reading. I even had to do it in my car because we were traveling at the time, but it didn't matter. Victoria just stepped in so clearly. I could feel her presence. I didn't know her well, but I described her personality and Bill was crying. He says, this is her, this is her. Such a feeling of properness, the mutual respect I felt from both of them. Later, after the reading, Bill enumerated each piece of evidence that came through and told me that there were 54 evidential pieces of information about his wife that he could not refute. They could, that I could not have possibly known. And that's the goal of every evidential medium. She showed me a paintbrush in her hand and painting art. I had no idea that Victoria was an artist. So I knew how she passed. She didn't have to share that with me, but she was telling me about her relationship with Bill. And I said, Bill, she's showing me you putting a jacket over a puddle. I can't remember the name of the guy that did that. And I believe she's showing me that you are just quite a gentleman. And he choked up and he said, no, Suzanne, that's not just symbolic. My God, I did that for her when we were dating. And I thought, 
wow, what a perfect memory, goosebumps, for Victoria to share. And I said, now she's showing me something about taking a shower. Oh, oh, wait, it's a towel warmer. You know those kind of towel warmers they have in Europe? I know a lot of you are watching from Europe and you probably have them in your bathrooms. But in America, less than 1% of us have towel warmers. And here's his wife, Victoria, showing me this with this heart opening that came from it. And he said, oh my gosh, Suzanne, it was one of the favorite presents I ever got her. It was this high-end towel warmer and she used it year round. So just again, something that I as the medium could not have known that shows Bill, death was not the end of Victoria. She's right here. So that, the first reading just was that birthday present that he was hoping for. But then later, we went back to Minneapolis on another trip, and this is not a very good picture, but here in the front you see uh, his sister Chris on the right side of the screen, and on the left is Victoria's best friend from childhood. And you see his two sons, and we're in the background there. Well, all of a sudden I feel Victoria, and she's saying, let's have a party. So we got Chris and her best, and Vic Victoria's best friend, and Bill together in our bus, and each of them had a loved one across the veil. Bill had Victoria, Chris had her husband across the veil, and I'm suddenly having a big mind blank about Victoria's friend's name, but her husband was across the veil. And each one of them was coming in at this gathering with evidence, all sitting around laughing, half of us in the physical world, half of us in the spiritual world. It was amazing. But just to share a little fun from that gathering, at one point I said, um, what is her friend's name? I'm not even getting it now. We'll call her Mary, Victoria's childhood friend who was there at the party. I said, Mary, Victoria is showing me some memory. She's showing me a great big chocolate cake. And there's something funny about it. And I feel a little nauseous. And Mary started saying, oh my God, Suzanne, when we were kids, we, we took a chocolate cake from the bakery that Victoria's family owned, and we ate the entire thing in one sitting. We were so sick. <laughs> How's that for evidence? And then I said, well, now she's showing me the two of you, you're at summer camp, and she's showing me these old mattresses with the, the gray stripes on the mattress on these bunk beds. And she's showing me that you signed your names on the mattress in pens and her eyes are getting really big. She said, we did that. I'd completely forgotten. And I said, and you were goofing around in, in canoes and splashing each other. And she's saying, this is incredible. And then I said, and now this is really weird, but she wants me to talk about you guys complaining about the hair on your arms. And Mary went, oh my God, Vicky. It really is you. She said, we used to sit around as teenage girls and complain about having hairy arms. We thought we were monsters. <laughs> That's the kind of thing you just can't make up. And what does it show us? That Victoria and the other spouses were right there. I remember Chris's husband talked about eating falafel. Now that's a Middle Eastern food. Bill Hammond said, what's falafel? And Chris said, it was his favorite food. He ate it almost every day. You can't make this stuff up. And just in case any of you are new to this work and think maybe a medium is reading people's minds, in a third reading that I did for Bill, Victoria came in and showed me a samurai sword. Bill said, no, that I have no connection with that. I said, I'm seeing it. You don't own it? And he said, no. So I said, Victoria, what are you talking about? Why are you showing me a samurai sword? And she said, ask our son, Churchill. He will know. After the reading, Bill checked with Churchill. Turns out Churchill got a samurai sword from a friend who went to Japan and had it in his apartment. Bill knew nothing about it. And that's how you know it's not telepathy. I'm not reading Bill's mind. And the funniest little thing, current events, they know our loved ones know what's going on in our lives. Now, during that third reading, Victoria showed me <laughs> that Bill had a torn toenail. And he said, I do. And Victoria said, you see, I was a detail person and there is no detail too small that I don't know about you now. And I hope that all of these stories bring you comfort as you think about your own loved ones and know that they're as close as your heart because that's where they reside as the light 
there's only light, there is only here in consciousness, in awareness. And you can see by this connection with the three couples, the couples across the veil, knowing things that happened to others who weren't even present, this validates the second principle of the awakened way of living. It's understanding that all of us, that you are part of one big web connecting all that is. Can you see it like a spider's web with a light shining through it and all of the sparkles. And if that spider's web had dew drops all over it, each of those would be shining. That's each of us, like a drop of light in the web. Love this stuff. Bill actually wrote a beautiful book about the three readings and the gift of knowing that life is eternal. If you have a chance to read The Ultimate Gift, it just really opens your heart. So we talked already that we may start this life asleep, but we don't have to stay there. We can become awake and aware. And look at the wording that we have on this one now. People who are asleep don't use consciousness constructively. What does that mean? Well, they hurt others. They're all about me, me, me. They don't share what they have. That's an unconstructive use of consciousness. We could think of many examples. But those who are aware that we are all one and all connected and what we do to ourselves affects others, what we do to others affects us, they have more productive uses of consciousness. They're more interested. We are more interested in serving and connecting in shining our light. But when I do these slides, it's very easy, isn't it, to say, oh, those sleepy people and point fingers, when in fact, this awareness that there are different levels can actually lead us to greater compassion and understanding when we realize that sleepy people are simply not evolved souls. Okay? Soul is ever evolving. It is already awakened, but it takes on a body with its characteristics that allows it to turn up even brighter. So in this picture, you have a little baby's hand, you have a teenager, adolescent, and then an adult. And this is one beautiful way to look at lesser evolved souls and spiritually evolved people. So would you expect a child to behave like an adult? No. So the people who are making headlines, who are fighting with each other, who are doing cruel things are asleep they're not as evolved or they wouldn't be doing those things. So if we are here to raise the quality of our consciousness, what's that equivalent to? Growing up spiritually. So you can kind of judge where you are on your spiritual path. Are you an adolescent or are you an adult spiritually? How evolved are you? So sleepy people exhibit these behaviors here. Their self-worth depends on titles, possessions, and roles. Boy, that was me in the past. When I retired from the Navy, I had to have Commander U.S. Navy retired on my checks. That was my identity, my rank. It's really interesting when you look back at it. Uh, people who, who need that title, who need a certain role. How about people who's, who's um, well, I'm sure you can think of many examples of how we get stuck in the role that we play, all right? They have a low tolerance for other points of view. Ooh, that is such an indicator of people who are just asleep. Now, please don't judge this as good or bad. Please judge this as evolved or not evolved, like a child, a teenager, and an adult. Doesn't that make it feel better already, all right? But sees this disagreement as a threat. Defensiveness is an instant indication within ourselves that we're not aligned with our higher self. Here's a big one. Excludes those who don't adhere to their worldview. Ooh, are we seeing a lot of that in our world right now? So can we see those folks with compassion and do something to help them realize we're all in this together? And maybe take a moment to see other people's worldview. We'll talk about that moving forward here. 
and then sees one's nation, religion, or race as more blessed than another. Can you see why these all fall into the category of sleepy behavior spiritually? Because once you are awakened, and remember the definition of that is unity awareness, also known as Christ consciousness. That just means we know at a deeper level, all is one. When you're in that unity awareness, these things just don't make sense anymore, but it takes a shift in awareness, okay? And the problem with sleepiness is it perpetuates a sense of separation. We put up boundaries that are strictly arbitrary when we wear our human suits. So if we can see lesser of all souls as spiritual children and have compassion for them and model awake behavior rather than judging, criticizing, that's lowering ourselves to lesser evolved behavior. This picture reminds me, if you, I was told, some of you may be child psychologists or psychologists and you understand, you may have had children that you've done this with. If you showed kids two clay balls the same size, you say, which one's bigger? They used to say, they're the same. And you squash one down, if they're under five years old and you make one really big and squash, which one's bigger? They'll, they'll now say, well, that one is. You know, and they can't see any other way. And that's the way some lesser evolved souls see the world. They literally cannot put themselves in someone else's shoes. So do we criticize the child for making that answer? Do we criticize an adult? We may feel a little frustration, but then we shift our focus and say, I see what's going on here. They can't help it. So let me model the behavior instead of criticizing. So each of us comes into this world with a certain intelligent quotient, an IQ. And it stays pretty much the same throughout our whole life, right? But we also come in with a consciousness quotient, your love quotient. How much is your light shining? We have tests that measure our IQ, but life itself is one big test for our love quotient, our consciousness quotient. Every act you do, every decision, every choice you make, everything you say helps to raise your consciousness quotient. I believe that we're not limited like with our IQ when it comes to consciousness quotient. I believe that we can turn up our light in many, many ways and increase that to the point where it stays that way. I'm going to come out of sharing the screen for a minute here, and I'd like some of you to share on the screen ways that, what are ways that we could tell somebody has the higher consciousness quotient? What would we see in them? You can type it in the chat box and we'll see. Compassion, absolutely. Being present, right? Not worrying about the future, focusing on the past. Ease, forgiveness, oh, I love this. Gratitude, joy, look at it. Yeah, yeah. wonderful. Uh-huh. Because we know in our hearts what is in alignment with our true self. All of these things. So if we want to raise our consciousness quotient permanently, we display everything that's coming in the chat right now on a regular basis. You do it till it becomes so habitual because it is who you are. It is your soul's character that when you are out of alignment, it's, it's, you just can't wait to get back to radiating this. Thank you for that. I love that. Woo, just popping off the screen. So we'll go back to the slides here. All right, so those we saw attributes of a high consciousness quotient. And we showed you this already. People who are asleep feel powerless victims, but the more we embody those characteristics that all of you just shared there, true happiness is a result. We're seniors in the class of life, the college of life. So the thing is, we come in here with the seed of the soul already germinating and we fertilize it. And there's, it's going to produce you, your path with your characteristics that your soul came here to work on one way or another. In other words, the acorn becomes the oak tree. It's not going to become a pine tree. You are going to be you. But the fertilizer and the water and the nutrients that you give to your soul are the choices that you make. 
So there are certain things that we can do for our own spiritual growth. And that's what I'm going to spend the rest of this time with one hour down already going over. And there are these four things. So now to the practical parts, you can expand your awareness. And the whole first part of this is all about expanding awareness of who and what we are. A little bit more about that before we move on to how we change our perspective, increase your capacity to love unconditionally. And the biggest one, free yourself from ego. Why do I say that's the biggest one? Because that is the whole spiritual path in a nutshell. It's all about shifting your identity from identifying with yourself as only human to realizing you are both human and a soul, like this guy is realizing in this famous woodcutting. It's not either or, you are both a human and a soul, both a soul and a human for this limited time period. So let's make the most of it. And the making of the most of it means we make the greatest choices. So again, none of this would have any meaning, any validity if this life were all they, there is. So some more stories to validate that you really are a soul here and now before you pass. I know some of you have heard this story before, but bear with me. I know there will be hopefully thousands who watch this on YouTube who will have not heard the story and it really needs to be shared so that all of you understand the soul knows what's going on in your human life, in your costume at all times. How could it not? So I was asked to connect with a woman in a coma. Her friends didn't know if they were following her wishes or not. I knew they wanted to know if they should pull the plug or not. Whoa, I didn't want the responsibility of asking that of a woman in a coma as a medium. What if I'm wrong? But I know that what convinces me that I'm connecting with souls is the evidence that comes through. So not knowing anything about this woman at all, I sat in my meditation room, expanded my awareness as I teach people to do in my mediumship classes. And I connected my heart through intention by saying, I would like to connect with the heart and the soul of the woman in a coma who is friends with Nancy, who reached out to me. That was the only way I knew how to connect with her. I didn't know where she was. I didn't know her name. And that's the way I wanted it. So I suddenly felt a presence, just like I do when I give a reading. And I knew I had connected with a person. Notice when you leave your body, you're still a person. You're just, you have a personality, you have patterns of behavior. So I said, if this is the woman in a coma, let me know. Was your coma caused by trauma or what caused it? And she said it was caused by a clot, not trauma. So I write this down. I wrote down the personality that I felt. She showed me she had an advanced degree in the counseling field. She showed me she volunteered at her church. She showed me, she gave me the name of the hospital where she was. She gave me several names. I'm writing all this down. There's nobody present to validate this because her friend that asked me to do this is not there. And what else? She showed me there's red hair near me. She said this, we're having active communication. There's red hair near me in the hospital. And she said, my friends from church stand around my bed in a circle every day singing songs to me. Well, I sent all of this information to her friend. I asked the woman, what are your wishes if they validate this? She told me the answer, but I didn't, I don't want to tell you yet what it was. Her friend came back and validated every single thing. Her coma was caused by a clot, not trauma. She had a PhD in counseling. She was in the specific hospital whose name she gave me. She had the members of her church standing around her bed in a circle singing to her every day and the red hair near her was a photo of her, an African-American woman in a red wig from a party. Her mom taped that photo right over the bed because it was a memory of a happy time. What more evidence could we need that I was talking to a soul, a soul, even though the body was unconscious, okay? And so at that time, 
I'm typing a letter back to her friend to say, this is her. I'm about to tell you her wishes. And the woman in a coma dropped in on me again. And she showed me a pair of these. Y'all remember these from the 70s or the 80s? A pair of striped toe socks. And I said, your friend in the coma is here right now. And she's showing me a pair of colorful toe socks. And she's also saying, California, here I come. Right back where I started from. I don't know what this is all about, but she has that message for you. So I sent it off. And do you know, there was, well, I'm going to come out of screen share for a minute here. Of the group of prayer chaplains from the church standing around her bed every day, there was one man who said, don't write to a medium and ask for her wishes. They're all frauds. You can't trust them. Do you know that that woman gave him a pair of striped toe socks the previous Christmas as a gift? That to me is like the soul saying, eh, gotcha, <laughs> busted. This is real, buddy. You need to believe it. And what's really cool is the minister from that church, when he read the email about her drop-in, wrote to me and said, Suzanne, I can't explain this to anybody other than that you really were talking to her soul because I've been offered my old job back at a church in California, but I don't know whether I should leave my congregation or not. So I've been praying. What do I do? I asked the big guy upstairs, should I go back to California? And just as a kind of joke, I said to our friend in the coma, maybe you can ask God what I should do. And she drops in when I'm typing an email to the folks at the church to say, California, here I come right back where I started from. Well, I sent her wishes to them then because she'd validated this is her. You can trust what I'm saying. And her answer as to should they pull the plug is something that stunned me so much and it has what has carried me through this whole coronavirus episode with no fear whatsoever and i share it with you now in hopes that it does the same for all of you in all of life's challenges she said they can pull the plug if they want if it's my time i'll go if it's not i'll stay So that's kind of stunning, isn't it? We go to heroic measures, we ask doctors to perform a miracle, and sometimes they don't happen. Why? If it's our time, we go. So we take precautions. We do what we can to protect ourselves and others. Of course, because we don't always have the bigger picture while we're in these finite bodies. But we have faith and trust in the light itself that all is in perfect order and that a greater intelligence than that which fits in this vessel knows what is best for us and we no longer have fear. So about six days later, after I sent that message to her friends, I'm sitting in meditation and suddenly this woman's spirit is present with me. She feels absolutely no different than the other two times she visited me. And she said, Suzanne, it's beautiful here. Tell them I'm happy not to be sad for me. Tell them to put my prayer chaplain sash on the platform today and play my favorite song because I will be listening. Whoa, I said, you passed? I typed this up, sent it to the friend and the minister and they confirmed she had passed six hours earlier at midnight. And again, let me reiterate, her soul felt no different than when I was talking to her while it was still connected with the physical body and once it had left the body behind. Because the soul is the soul. That is your light, the soul. What a beautiful lesson. I'm so grateful to Spirit for sharing these with us. So that woman experienced this peace, this beauty, and the final principle of the awakened way is that you find your way home through the heart. That peace and beauty that she felt when she crossed the veil is present for all of us anytime we remember we are both 
human and a soul now, just like the woman in the coma shared with us at all times. So all we have to do is shift our focus from the role of human to the fullness and completeness of the soul to find the peace, to find the joy, to find the love. And the role is what we play. And some of us wear uniforms and it's a costume, but all of us wear a costume and we call it a body and we use it to mask ourselves from the rest of the world. How was I able to go from wearing this costume, this uniform to my current work? As after Susan passed, I knew she could not be gone forever and I began meditating daily. So it was my dedication to coming to learn, is there a greater reality? If so, can we all tap into it? I'm gonna sit quietly and quiet my mind. I'm going to shut out the outer world to get to know my inner world. And with that military discipline, I knew I would do it every day until I met my goal. And I guarantee you, if you spend only five minutes a day committed to your soul's growth with some kind of spiritual practice that will allow you to feel the presence, to ask the kinds of questions such as, who am I? Why am I here? Show me the greater reality. Your life will be transformed. And you'll come to know these metaphors are more than just stories. That like this iceberg, the physical part of you is just the tiny tip of the fullness of who you are. The part underwater in this metaphor would represent you, the soul, which is the wholeness of that iceberg. Yet if that iceberg would, were to melt, it would melt into the entire sea of consciousness, all of it, the sea of love, because the definition of love is lack of separation, okay? So you are both the physical part above water, the non-physical part below water, and the water itself, which we will come to fully know when we dissolve back into being the sea of love. But you can do that. You can dissolve in any minute, in any instant, and you can do that regularly, through sitting in the power. I have multiple free meditations on my website, suzanngeesman.com slash gifts. They're my gift to you. I show the process of how to get into an expanded state of awareness with my seven steps to connecting with higher consciousness. And you're the one that needs to do the practice. And I need to give you a warning like this lady says here, it just becomes a matter of doing the work. She says, I realize I've only been at it for five minutes, but meditation isn't bringing me the peace of mind that I was promised. <laughs> and that's the problem when we're in human mode. We want we want results now, now, now. And we expect bells and whistles and lights and beautiful spiritually transformative experiences every time we meditate. Just enjoy the journey. And you will notice when you are committed to raising your quality of consciousness, your consciousness quotient, your love quotient, when you're committed to that, because nothing less will satisfy why your soul came here, you will see results. You will feel more love. You will start to tap into others at a level beyond the mind. You will start to know things as the gifts and fruits of the spirit awaken. You will become more intuitive. You'll become more peaceful because what we're doing is raising our consciousness, coming into alignment with the entire field of creative potential and intelligence itself through the simple practice of dedicating five, 10, 15, 20 minutes a day of shutting out the outer world to get to know the greater reality. So that is the first part of spiritual growth, expanding your awareness. How about changing your perspective on a regular basis, coming to know that you are not alone. These, of course, is a human depiction of angels, but we all have guides, absolutely. And my guides speak to me every day and give me beautiful messages I'm so grateful for. We call them the Daily Way. You can go to dailyway.org and subscribe to get these in your inbox. But that 
same group who gives me messages every day is the group we call Sanaya, who I have channeled in sessions around the country so that all of us can sit in the presence and the awareness that a higher power speaks to all of us when we simply ask, when we simply ask. So when you sit in the power, when you've learned to quiet your mind enough, did you know that all you have to do is believe your guides are with you, connect your heart with theirs through intention and ask a direct question of your guides. Instead of wandering around saying, I don't know what to do. How can I find more peace with what's going on in the world? How can I make a difference? Do you feel how that energy is dissipated? But if you sit in meditation, quiet the mind. And by the way, there's a free uh, ebook for meditation on that same gifts page. If you question how to meditate, there are many ways. You sit, you expand your consciousness and you Connect your heart with guides, even if you don't feel them, see them, feel them. It doesn't matter. Trust that they're here and ask specifically, what is my path? Or what do I need to know now? Or is it time for me to make this big life change? Whatever your question, when you ask it that pointedly, that specifically, directly to your guides, they will answer you. And I have a video on YouTube of the many ways they answer. And it's not always directly hearing right away. But when you understand that they speak to us with intuitive knowing, by sending just the right person into our path, by drawing us to just the right book that we need, an article that speaks to us, you'll see how your answers, your answers come to you in beautiful ways. So changing our perspective is huge if we want to get more of the bigger picture, to be more aware as awakened beings of how to live more in alignment with who we are. Seeing with the eyes of the soul is what spirit asks us to do. We look about as separate finite beings through these physical eyes and all we see are separate looking objects. When we can simply move our awareness, our consciousness to the heart, and literally sense from that place a higher way of being. So practice that from time to time. In fact, we can do that right now. Just close your eyes for a moment. And it may seem that, that you're seeing the world through your eyes at all times, but literally move your awareness to the heart area. What if you were seeing literally seeing from your heart, not just out the front, but in 360 degrees, suddenly you can be like a passive radar receiving all kinds of insights unfiltered by belief system, by the brain. This will increase your knowing of what to do in any one moment. And one of the reasons this works is because this is where you connect with guides and loved ones who have passed through the heart, not the head. Move your awareness here, ask for guidance and insights, test answers that you get, test things people tell you from this place, the heart, and that's seeing with the eyes of the soul. That's a, you can open your eyes now. That's a huge shift in perspective. It's called heart-centered living. Do that more often and watch how that changes your sense of peace throughout the day. Life is like a theater in the round. And the problem is most of us take one seat in this theater of life and we stay in it. Sleepy people, people who are not awakened, refuse to leave their seat. There's only one way to see it, this way. But what if we were to get up out of our seat every once in a while? It's so funny. I remember doing a reading recently for a couple the woman's father came in and I said, your father's saying that you behave just like this in certain circumstances. And she said, no, I don't. And the, her husband says, yes, you do. And it's so funny how we have different perspectives of each other. I have a friend who recently uh, shrieked really loudly when she found a palm, big palmetto bug in her kitchen. And her husband didn't even get up out of bed. 
This was in the middle of the night. And she said, why didn't you come to me when I shrieked? And he said, oh, you tend to over-exaggerate. I just had to laugh at that. Now, she would say, no, I don't. But that's his perspective. Does that mean it's false? Or is all of it is perception reality? What if we learn to be flexible as the souls we are and put ourselves in each other's shoes? Here's, uh, I'm not gonna go here very far, but this is a picture of a beautiful, famous painting of uh, different perspectives. And we're seeing a lot of uh, discord in the United States these days because so many people are entrenched in their seat. Everything is not one way or another. It's not black and white. I used to see it that way, but why would we want to get out of our seats? Maybe we'll learn something. Maybe we'll change our entrenched beliefs. Maybe we'll just find compassion. Definitely we would find peace and understanding. So everything is not the same for a reason. Why come here as souls at all if we're all going to think the same way? So many of you who are part of my community have heard the disco ball analogy, but it's a great way of understanding why we have so many different viewpoints. This one disco ball has one light at the center, just like source. And look at this. Imagine this disco ball has seven and a half billion lenses representing each one of us in a human body, souls, rays, extensions of the one light. It's the same light, but each one of those lenses has a slightly different angle, a different lens on the outer world for the experience of it for what it's going to allow the light to experience from that viewpoint. So how is a light that's facing this way, a lens facing that way, going to agree with one that's facing that way? They're not supposed to. You know you're in alignment with someone when you have harmonious vibrations. And if you don't, it's just because you're filtering things a different way. This is just another way of having compassion, changing our perception of what's going on in the world. It's one big dance, isn't it? The yin and the yang, this world of duality exists for a reason, for the dance. But we see things in black and white. What if we just saw it as a different color? Maybe I shouldn't have chosen those with an election coming up, but it is kind of uh, interesting, isn't it? that there are opposites. That's the way our world is designed, but we can come to see that as human beings, we're like this coin that my guides had me design. We are both sides at once. This is a picture of two sides of one coin. On the left, you see the side that represents our human nature, always dancing, this dance of duality, trying to find the middle way with each other. Yet there are aspects of each other in us represented by those little dots within each side. The other side of the coin represents our soul with the heart connecting both sides. The spiral represents the growth of the soul ever, ever evolving onward and upward and limitless nature exemplified by the infinity signs. Put those two sides together and you have one whole entity, human and soul. So finding the perfect balance, alignment with both is our goal, but we can choose what perspective we take at any one time, the soul's perspective or the human's perspective, or integrate them both. This is a great diagram to show you that you get to choose and the way you choose your perspective determines your peace. Are you feeling off balance with what's going on in our world? Then you're very much the experiencer, caught in the duality, us versus them. Frustrated, angry, fearful. That's okay. Just realize you can wake up from that. Once you awaken, ride that spiral of awareness or go to the heart. These are all just metaphors to become the light looking down like the woman in a coma must have looked at her body in the bed and saying, from this perspective, I see the wholeness of everything. 
I see different stories. I'm going to make a better choice when I step back into the experience. You can do this at any moment. Notice your dancing in duality, rise above, witness with a sense of neutrality. Isn't that interesting? Now that I'm out of the drama, what would be a better choice when I step back into my role? You have the flexibility to choose. This is uh, Gumby. Anybody remember Gumby dolls? Always flexible. I show this with a picture of my Susan who was a sergeant in the Marine Corps. The Marine Corps' motto is Semper Fi. Always flexible. Always faithful. Sorry. Always faithful. But we made, I changed this to be what they say. They, the Marines will say Semper Gumby, meaning always be flexible. Great advice for any of us. Semper Gumby. Because when we become rigid, stuck in our seat, our viewpoint, we're back to crossing that line and being sleepy again. So does this mean when we know these things, when we awaken, that life is always easy? <laughs> Not at all. There will be times, how many of you have had your computer crash, right? Or, or challenges with very human things. What do we do? Shift our point of view. Shift your perspective from human to soul, step out of the role. This means taking a moment to moment dose of awareness. What's my point of view at the moment? If I'm off balance, if I'm angry, frustrated, lashing out, oops, human point of view, and that's okay. But it doesn't feel good. I wanna turn my light up. It takes a simple intention and you've shifted focus. Take a deep breath and you've risen above to the witness, you're centered. That's where the peace is found. I love this. We slide back and forth. Agitation, feeling really, really high or really, really low, both are agitation. But when you get centered and say that beautiful phrase, isn't that interesting? That's when you find the peace. So, the reason that we get knocked off balance is that every emotion, every thought that we have is an energetic vibration. Everything really is energy. Everything vibrates. I have the perfect picture. Some of you may not have seen this yet. I was able to capture proof that everything is energy. Do you want to see it? You ready? It's stunning. This is Rudy, the sailing wiener dog, my beautiful boy, Rudy, who had rolled around on this chair and looking a little bit like Einstein here, who also knew that everything is energy. That's just a little joke, of course. But the reason we get so unsettled is because we allow some of our emotions to take on higher and higher energy. And the more they're out of alignment with the true soul, which comes from that sea of peace, we feel it. So... You can allow the waves of vibration to knock you off balance, like this woman on the left side of the picture, or you can become the witness and rise above the waves. More analogies to understand what happens when we live the awakened way. I hope you guys are enjoying this stuff. And most of all, exercise, the greatest muscle you have, in shifting back and forth, and that's the heart. Go to the heart. The quickest way to come back into balance at any one time is to express gratitude. There is always something to be grateful for. And to send love out, especially in the form of compassion for those we wanted to judge or criticize, see them from the higher perspective, from the heart. That's the muscle that needs the most exercising. When you do that, <laughs> you learn to stay on top of the waves, but it takes attention, it takes awareness to remain balanced. I like this, this uh, little left brain slide here. The ego, the human side of you, is easily offended and insulted, gets angry and upset, or gets ecstatic and over happy. The ego can get really puffed up, 
but it can also be humiliated. See the waves up and down, back and forth we go. When you're the witness, look at the response to those same reactions. You're at peace even when you're insulted. You're at peace even when the human side gets angry. You're at peace even when you're ecstatic. If you're puffed up by something somebody says, you catch yourself and says, wait, that's ego. I'm just so grateful people feel that way. If you feel humiliated by something somebody says, the soul says, I'm so grateful for the lesson this has to teach me. Go back to gratitude no matter what, and you've stepped right into alignment with your true nature. But notice, neither side of this is right or wrong. That's just human to display the characteristics on the left side, isn't it? Don't judge yourself if you experience these characteristics in yourself. Don't judge others. Simply notice it. Simply take that dose of awareness, be flexible, and shift your awareness to the soul side and say, I'm so grateful I noticed, and now I can take a breath and respond differently. I can make a higher choice. And that's what it's all about, isn't it? Making choices from the heart, from the soul nature instead of the human nature. I hope that after participating in this today, you'll see things differently. You'll see other people and you'll be able to say without judgment, ah, they don't realize they're a soul. I'll just send them love. And then in yourself say, oh, look at that conditioned behavior. Look at that way I responded just by habit to what that person said. I'm going to choose differently now and go from being a freshman to a sophomore to a junior in the school of raising my consciousness. So, you know, you can actually get these sunglasses at Walmart <laughs> and we can see the world through heart shaped glasses, or you can just use your divine nature and shift on the spot and see through the filter of the heart instead of the human programming. Understand that human beings learn by trial and error, okay? We all do. We all try some things. We make choices. They don't work. I remember, I love when Sanaya says all the time, how is that working for you? <laughs> there is always a better way, and it's going to be the way that's aligned with the heart. But we move back and forth all the time from our soul nature to our human nature. That's what the S and the H means here. And so it's like you have this little dial, and guess what? You control the dial. You, the integrated human and soul at the same time. Which side of me am I going to show now? You know, there are times when it's very appropriate to be human. You're driving through traffic. You need to have that human side fully dialed up. I remember I, I, uh, I gave a quiz to a class one time to rate themselves in different circumstances. How awakened are you in these circumstances? And there was one where it said, you were just cut off by someone in traffic. And I remember my husband, Ty, took the quiz and he gave himself like a five or six, you know, very awakened. And I looked at him and I said, really? <laughs> Again, perspective, right? But I'm not one to talk because I, some of you have heard this story as well. I was driving our big RV, 42 foot bus with a car in tow behind it in San Francisco, 10 lanes of highway traffic, heavy traffic, driving this massive bus. And this guy cut me off. <gasps> I am a little bit embarrassed to admit it, but at the time I made a gesture. <laughs> and, <laughs> It may have said something non-spiritual. <laughs> and in this passenger seat beside me, Ty looked over at me and he went, yes, she's human. And if you go back to that dial, yes, in that moment, the human soul dial was 100% over to human. So what you do when you catch yourself is you laugh, you understand what's going on, and I dialed up a little bit more of the soul side. 
And we can do that from moment to moment. And when your goal is to raise your consciousness, you live a love-centered life, and you act in every, you ask in every instant, how would love act? How would love act when this guy cut me off? Well, maybe the guy's in a hurry. Maybe he is totally asleep and is not acting like a spiritually evolved person, but I'm just going to wish him well. And that's going to make a much bigger difference for all of us. If I'm radiating love instead of the gesture I just made. So this question, how would love act, reminds me of a time, this is leading up to some stories that I'd love, love, love to share. And again, I apologize if you've heard them, but I walked into a country store when I was living out in Washington state, still in the Navy at the time. And there on the counter were a bunch of these little wristbands, WWJD. This is indicative of my spiritual status and my religious awareness at the time. I looked at the clerk and I said, what does that mean? And he looked at me and he said, really? What would Jesus do? And I laughed. I was really embarrassed because I didn't know that's what it meant. And this is just to show all of you that I was raised with no religion. I know, I know the basic story of Christmas and the story of Jesus, but I also knew the story of other religions. I was just raised without any formal religion. So imagine my surprise as I embarked on this spiritual path after a couple of years of meditating to suddenly ask, is it possible to tune into any of the masters, Jesus, Buddha, archangels, can any of us connect with those higher energies? And I found out through personal experience, and it's my greatest desire that all of you have this personal experience, that we can tap into any aspect of higher consciousness. Why? Because we are rays of the same light, aren't we? All of us. This is the oneness. This is unity awareness. That's why they call it Christ consciousness, because of a Christ is one who understands we are all expressions of the one light. So that was my awareness of Jesus. So imagine when I felt him step in when I asked if we can connect with anyone, I would like to feel Jesus. I'm not going to tell that whole story now. It's in a on a video on the on my website under videos in a video called The Miracle of Christ Consciousness. But it was one of the most spiritually transformative experiences of my life and showed me how connected we all are. It left me sobbing. But I also knew then if he will come when we ask, if any of the higher beings will come when it serves our greater good, then when we have real challenges, we can take them to those with the bigger picture. So I was having a challenge with a woman back where I lived in Florida. She's given me permission to share this story. And I, I didn't like the way I felt when I was around her. I walled off my heart. I put up my shields, my defenses. And I knew she felt that. And it wasn't who I knew I am inside. Have any of you ever felt that? There are certain people that come to mind and you just go, oh, I wish they would just go away. That's very human. It's very understandable. But in trying to be more awake, I needed help. So I sat in meditation and I asked, whoever's listening, please show me how to relate to this woman. I don't know how to handle what I'm feeling. And what happened stunned me. All of a sudden, there's Jesus stepping in front of me in a meditation, full face in front of me. And he knelt, he knelt down in front of me and took my foot in his hand and washed it. And I had heard the story from the Bible about Jesus washing the feet. I wasn't that familiar with it, but the message was so clear. 
And Jesus said, you are all equal, all are worthy. She is crying out for help. And I knew if he was doing that for me, not even been raised with awareness of Jesus, we all just have this reverence for the masters. I was embarrassed. I was awkward. Like, don't do that to me. Who am I? And he was saying, we should all be doing this for each other when we would be if we all knew who each other was. And he let me feel the unconditional love that the masters have for all of us. And I suddenly had no greater desire than to wash that woman's feet. I knew I wouldn't do it literally, but to be in her presence and love her like he was washing me with that love in that moment. I suddenly wanted to wash everybody's feet. I just wanted to tell everybody, I'm so sorry. I haven't realized who you all are. Please just let me love you. And he said to me, you will walk in her shoes today. So he faded away. I feel transformed. I hopped on my bicycle and I rode two miles to her house, knocked on her door. She opened the door, stunned. Suzanne, what are you doing here? I mean, we're friends, but I never just showed up at her door. And I said, I just want to go to coffee with you. I just, I'm home for a week from traveling. I just want to, why don't we go have coffee? She said, I'd love that. And all of a sudden I looked down and I said, oh my gosh, let's go to Panera, but I can't go in Panera because I'm wearing my bike shoes, little cleats on the bottom. And she says, oh, no problem. Here, you can wear a pair of my sandals. And my friends, I kid you not, I started laughing because minutes later, I am literally walking in her shoes, just as I was told I would be doing. I have goosebumps just remembering that moment. We sat in that coffee shop and talked, and I just felt so much love. I didn't tell her what had happened. But you know what's funny is one of the things that had really been bugging me is every time we got together, she shared this challenge she was been, she'd been having. And I tried to advise her and help her with the challenge, but she never listened. She just kept harping on it, bringing it up over and over, and it just got old. But what was so stunning is when I sat there just wanting to love her unconditionally, guess what? She never brought it up because she no longer had to. I learned the lesson. Do you see? All of the things that happen in your life happen for you, for you. And so I never told her what happened. I know that she felt loved in that moment. I felt no resistance. The walls were down. And I left her house and I went and I rode my bike to my mother's house. This was back before my mom passed. She was in her late 80s. I walked in the door and she said, Susie, I'm so glad you're here. She said, I need you to do me a favor. Would you cut my toenails for me? I just can't bend over and do it anymore. And again, my friends, within minutes, of having Jesus bending down before me, washing my feet, I found myself holding my mother's feet in my hands. This is the way spirit works through our lives when we're committed to raising our consciousness, when we're committed to recognizing who we all are, when we come to know that all of us are special with a capital S, no one is more special than another. All of us are unique, yes, and special. And who is it that's going to teach us our lessons more than anybody? Very often, those we live with and our family, right? Aren't they the ones that push our buttons most often? When you feel yourself getting angry or, or judgmental, that lesson is for you. They're pushing that button because at a soul level, they have to. And when you've learned that lesson, they won't push that button anymore. But I had a family member who was pushing a button of mine over and over. So what did I do? I took it to meditation. And I hope you'll do this same thing when you become aware of sleepy behavior in yourself as I was, because I was judging that family member big time. It was not Ty. And then I sat there and I said, Spirit, help me see this in a different way. Help me to know how to deal with my loved one. And suddenly that loved one was in my face in this meditative state. 
His face was right in front of mine and the funniest thing happened. Suddenly he had a zipper over his face and he reached up in my mind's eye and he pulled the zipper down from his face to his heart. It opened up and Jesus stepped forward. And he says, this is what I've been trying to teach all of you. Spirit itself, source, is inside each of you. The light is in each of you. And it can be in, the, you know, in any form. It's not just Jesus. It doesn't matter what your religion is. It's the light is behind the costume that we all wear. When we can see it in ourselves and in others, then we can love unconditionally. Then we are awakened and can't act any other way than loving. That very day, stunned, I went down to the square where we lived in the villages at the time. And this kid was walking around in this hoodie. I found it online later, just like this, a Spider-Man hoodie, all zipped up. And I said to Ty, look at that. Look how much fun that kid is having because he can hide behind that. Nobody knows who he is. And I didn't make the connection until later. What a perfect metaphor for exactly what I had just been shown. All of us are hiding behind these People suits. These days in 2020, when we're filming this, we're hiding behind our masks. We can't even see each other smiling other than the crinkle in our eye, but we can open our hearts and send out our true light. But the goal of awakening is to unzip the human costume and let our true light shine. So I know we're going to run a little over. I hope you don't mind, but I'd love for you to do a little exercise with me right now. Just take a moment, take a deep breath and close your eyes. And bring to mind someone, family member, somebody in politics, somebody in world news, a friend, someone who you've been judging, someone who's rubbing you the wrong way. And I'd like you to hold them in your mind's eye, see them standing in front of you. Now you're probably seeing them with consciousness behind your eyes, but now move your consciousness down to the heart. And just like that, you shift your focus from human to the light that is within all of us, that connects all of us. Now seeing that light radiated out and connected with the light in that one standing before you, it really is in there. And in your mind's eye, reach up and pull the zipper down that is in front of that person and really see the light now that's in there. It may be dim. Their behavior may be such that they haven't learned to turn up their light, but it's there or they would not be present in your life. What a different way to see them. Send a ray of gratitude out to the world, to spirit, to your own self for taking on board this practice and just come back, be present with us again. And just remember, we can do this practice anytime. Everybody's special. A friend of mine who heard this lesson was given a real life test. She worked in a uh, homeless shelter at the front administrative desk. She told me that after hearing this lesson, she had a man come up to the desk asking to be admitted to the shelter. He had five kids with him. She said, I need your driver's license to register you. She looked down and stamped on his Florida driver's license were the words, sexual predator. She said, Ooh, she felt all of her human programming come to the surface. She said, I suddenly remembered that teaching and I tried, I put a zipper on the front of his face. She said, Suzanne, I couldn't believe how hard it was for me to see beyond his costume and beyond the label. I just had real trouble and that was an eye opener for me. And then I realized it's not my human place to judge 
him. And suddenly I reached down and I stamped his work, uh, his past to get in and I let his family in. And she said she worked in the corporate world, international business her whole life. And she said, by far the richest experience of her life has been working in that shelter and seeing with the eyes of the soul. This picture reminds me of how all of you have helped the dogs in Jen's shelter. That's why it feels so good. Shifting perspective. Increasing your capacity to love unconditionally. Well, we showed you sleepy behavior. So non-sleepy behavior. You see others' negativity as ignorance of who they are, that they are the light. And you see this with no feelings of superiority, but pure compassion. You live in the present moment, free of emotional addictions and attachments, and you're at peace. I hope you're recognizing these because you live this way. If not, may this be a goal. You have a fully open heart, very little ego, and you don't engage the egos of others. And this is the biggie. You realize we are not human. We are divine and you unzip the masks each of us wears and you see that. Just these intentions allow us to love unconditionally. We see each other as all lights, different perspectives, different viewpoints. But if you turn this light upside down, look, we all flow from the same source. Isn't that cool? Or another way to see it, like the tree of life, same roots, same source. And so to the leaves on the tree, to argue with the other leaves is silly. You know, I'm on this side of the tree, you're on that side of the tree, so I'm better than you. My viewpoint is better than yours. That's just like cells in the body. Cells, we as cells in the body of humanity, arguing with each other just shows we don't have the big picture, the awakened view. So I like this symbol of the dance. If we see each other as sharing the same roots, the same source, it changes everything. And that we may have our differences like these pictures show, but we're all parts of a whole. I hope I'm preaching to the choir today. I hope there are some of you that are hearing nothing new, but at the same time, may we all just celebrate the joy of knowing what we've come to know. Doesn't it feel awesome? So freeing ourselves from ego is the final step here and raising our consciousness quotient. There are many ways to do it. But it starts with recognizing you're playing a role. And we all have different parts that make up our story, but that's just the one level. At another level of us, there's no story at all. Yet we put a name on ourselves and on our story, we become attached to it and that causes us to suffer. So it's real good exercise to sit down and identify all your labels. Like I said, I used to call, I was the commander, right? And now I don't even like to say I'm a spiritual teacher or I'm a medium because that puts me in a role with rules. What role do you play that come with rules? Anybody that goes to a holiday dinner with your family, do you fall right back into certain roles and rules of how you habitually react with those people at the table, then you know what I'm talking about. But can you shift your perspective and be the ultimate you, the soul who's playing in both worlds? Remember, Semper Gumby, always flexible. Look for the rules that have been ruling your life. Are they helpful or a hindrance? Quick example, me, before I realized I was stuck in my old role. This is me as the Navy commander. Once I retired, we're still allowed to go on military bases. And I found it very interesting that when you go through a gate at a military base, they always check your identification card. Once I got that retiree card, there's no set rule. Do the soldiers, sailors at the gate have to salute an officer? If you're in uniform, that's a rule that I played 20 years by. You must salute an officer. And if an enlisted person doesn't salute an officer, you call them on it. It's one of the rules of the game, okay? So 
I would go through the gate and sometimes they would salute me and sometimes they wouldn't. But what would really bug me is if Ty was at the wheel, almost 100% of the time when he was retired, they saluted him, but they didn't salute me because I'm a woman. So I would feel myself getting uptight until I realized, look at that. I'm stepping back into my old role. How is it making me feel? So I learned to say at the gates, isn't that interesting? Because you get to the point where you ask, does it matter? And this is where people on the spiritual path say, well, when do I act? You always act if something's going to bring more love in our world. In this case, I just said, isn't that interesting? And I drive one through. But if I saw somebody hitting a dog or doing something that hurts, absolutely go you're going to act because that is in alignment with the soul's nature. But the main point is notice the roles you play. Notice the rules that you have placed on them and others in society, in your particular culture, place on those roles and then ask, does this role with its rules lead me to feel separate from others or does it lead me to a sense of oneness with others? If the separation is there, shift perspectives and ask, how can I come into alignment? So examine what your story is and see if you're a prisoner to it. This is where the spiritual path is about shifting your identity from the persona, the ego, the story, to both a story and a soul and knowing you can step above it at any time. And when other people do things that hurt you, the greatest thing you can keep in mind is hurt people hurt people. We just got back from four months of traveling and right before we got on the road, Ty and one of our new neighbors, we're new to everybody here, got in a tiff and it was ugly. And I thought, oh no, for the rest of our time living here, I'm going to be afraid of running into this person. I don't want to live like that. So we just arrived back and this neighbor drove by, rolled down his window and said, welcome back. And I thought, what happened here? And he looked at us and he said, I owe you all an apology. He said, I was in a really bad place last year. My dad had just passed. And it was like I could hear angels singing. I'm asking for miracles to happen in your life. And one of the, a miracle, the definition is a change in perspective, isn't it? So if somebody hurts you or you hurt somebody else, the miracle would be coming to understand why sleepy humans act the way they do. And when you have that realization, that's when compassion and forgiveness happen instantly, instantly. Talk about raising your consciousness quotient. Talk about aligning yourself and waking up. Forgiveness, gratitude, all of these things. Stepping into an alignment with your true soul is the way to do it. All righty. As we come down to the bottom here, oh, you know, Bev, I'm going to go a little over because I don't want to skip these stories. And I'm sorry for all of you if I promised you two hours, but I'm looking at this story that's coming up and I don't want to skip over it because there's a lesson in here about pets that I know some of you will want to hear. So I'm just going to go over as much as the old role of the commander says, stay on time. I'm going to model what I've been saying and step outside of the rules. <laughs> Good. All right. Okay. So just to show you that we are again, part of something greater and to add some magic to this, I want to tell you the story of Andrew. Some of you have heard this before and it's one of my favorites. His brother, Matthew reached out to me and he said, I'm at a precipice. My brother, Andrew died and I don't know what to do. And that sounded kind of ominous. So I did the reading for him. And Andrew came through so beautifully. This is Matthew, the brother who had the reading in the center. Andrew has the cap on. He showed me that he passed 
from a brain tumor. And indeed he did. He said, my brother shaved my head and his son's, Matthew's son's head in support of me when, when I had my cancer. And indeed, this is Matthew's son on his left side and he had shaved his head. The reading was just beautiful. At that time, I said, your, your, your brother's telling me you just bought a lottery ticket and that's something you don't normally do. And he says, how do you know that? I just did. And I said, I know that because Andrew's right here and he sees what's going on in your life. Well, that reading changed Matthew's life. There were things that his brother told him. He told him, Matthew, you need to get up, up off the couch and get the chemicals out of your system. And Matthew said, oh my gosh, depression and addiction are my two greatest challenges right now. But when he heard from his brother that his brother knew about that, he turned his whole life around. I met his parents shown here in this photo, uh, the two on the right side of the screen, Matthew, Matthew's parents and Andrew's parents, they, they came with so much gratitude to a conference I did because they said, Matthew is now teaching yogurt, yogurt. He's now teaching yoga and he's in recovery, all from hearing from his brother across the veil. Well, it was a real thrill for Ty and for me when we got to visit and meet Matthew and his parents at Andrew's family home in Newburgh, Oregon, Oregon. So we got together, the whole family, and I said, let's do a reading and bring Andrew in again. And it was a really wonderful reading. Matthew's son was there, the one that was originally showed up in the first reading. He was mentioned in that reading. I said, uh, Connor is his name. I said, Connor, your uncle Andrew is saying that uh, you need to crack down on your studies. And he watches you when you write term papers in school. And he says, bro, you got to quit the BS. And the nephew went, oh my gosh, that's me. I'm bored. I just write whatever I want in my term papers. And I said, he's suddenly showing me a banana peel and bushes in the front of the house. What's up with that? And the Connor, the nephew, crossed his arms and he says, man, Andrew's ratting me out. I just threw a banana peel in the bushes out front. <laughs> so what does that show us, huh? Our loved ones see what we're doing, which may frighten some of you a little bit and cause us to act a little bit more in alignment with what we should be doing, making wiser choices, right? So here are Anne and Mark. Andrew and Matthew's parents. And when we visited them at their house, the most astounding thing happened. And if I hadn't experienced it myself, I might think this was crazy. But this will show all of you how malleable consciousness is and how loved ones can take on form and be present. As I was standing in the dining room talking with Ty and Mark, Anne was in the kitchen, Suddenly, the family cat ran through the dining room. I looked down, and in my mind's eye, the cat was wearing a Superman costume. <laughs> I know it sounds ridiculous, but I looked. It was like superimposed in a vision on this cat. And then I sensed Andrew's presence. And he said, I'm in here, ask my mom. So I excused myself from the guys, feeling like I was losing my mind. I walked into the kitchen and I said, Ann, did Andrew used to run around the house like Superman? And she said, I'm gonna come out of share for a second. She said, oh my gosh, Suzanne, for years as a child, he thought he was Superman. In fact, I still have his little Superman pajamas that he wore from age three to seven until they literally fell apart. He would wear them to slumber parties. He would wear it at Halloween. He was Superman. Why do you ask? And I said, well, he just showed me that when he wants to feel near you, because the only thing he misses about you is your touch, because he's around all the time, he blends his consciousness with your cat. 
so that he can feel you through the cat. I got goosebumps right now, and it's probably for many of you who are having this sudden realization that after a loved one has passed, your pet may suddenly snug up against you more often or act unusual. And Anne looked at me and she said, oh my God, Suzanne, we got that cat after Andrew passed and he jumps up in bed and snuggles between Mark and me just like Andrew used to do. Wow. So this is what consciousness can do because it is pure presence. It's everywhere and we are this consciousness. So it will get message to us, messages to us in the most magical ways. So free yourself from the story, from the belief, from the pattern behaviors, align yourself with your true nature, and that's where we find true freedom. We get shackled to our roles and our rules. And another great sage, Nisargata Maharaj made this quote, without self-realization, meaning when you don't realize you are both human and a soul, you will be consumed by human desires and fears, repeating themselves meaninglessly in endless suffering. So if you have gotten caught up in the drama lately, if life is frustrating, scary, fearful, that's just pattern behavior. You can step out of that at any time by recognizing it as the story it is, as the costume it is, removing the costume and stepping into your true nature. Just remember, human nature is the default setting while you're in a body. And that's why for awakened beings, this means daily effort to set ego aside. Just pat it on the head and say, I know you go with the body. I know the story will always be here, but I am committed to being aware now, to remaining awake, to taking off the shackles, because this is how I choose to live. I am free. Nothing feels more joyous. Nothing is more blissful. Just be aware that ego will try to push back, okay? It's gonna give you lessons. It's gonna put people in your face for the lessons you still haven't learned, but just, go with it. Remember, this is all about the dance of life. You get to choose to be on the dance floor, stuck in the crowd, or be like this little girl and let spirit guide you around the dance floor. I love this visual. You can rise above at any time. So have a spiritual practice of your own that keeps you in awakened awareness from moment to moment so that when you get out of alignment, which we all do as we're on the path to awakening, you notice it. And people say, yeah, well, Suzanne, you meditate every day and you were this military officer, so you're really disciplined. And I say, it's not the discipline, it's this. It's commitment. I got an email yesterday from someone that just made my day. She just wrote to say, she just wrote to thank me. She said, your unrelenting commitment to service. And I was humbled by that, but I see it in so many of you. And it's transformational. And it's, it's why all of these things that I'm sharing with you today were given to me. All credit goes to spirit. It takes the commitment. I hope that I've light, lighted that fire within you today to, to really commit to, to becoming more aware, to being that light for others, to bringing more peace into your own world. I love this quote by Joel Goldsmith. The, the attainment of spiritual fulfillment does not come lightly or quickly. The whole point is whether the desire for it becomes the ultimate meaning of life or whether we are hoping to achieve it in our spare time. Whoa, that kind of gets your attention, doesn't it? So it reminds me of this woman that wrote to me and she said, Suzanne, I heard that we can open up our spiritual sight 
by clearing the calcification off the third eye and that there's a special toothpaste that reduces the calcification. My human side wanted to kind of laugh at that, actually. The Navy commander says, that's ridiculous. But I went into meditation and I asked. I felt in the heart that wasn't quite right. And indeed, I found that there are, it, it is an energetic blockage of the third eye that we can clear through a spiritual practice. So all of the blockages within us may exist from a lifetime of being human and maybe a little sleepy. And I'm sorry, there is no magic pill. It's a pill that you take every day and it comes from aligning with your true self. And it's a huge dose of love and compassion and all of those qualities of higher self that all of you contributed in the chat box there. When you have a regular dedicated practice to being awake, to living that, modeling that for others, then you see your true nature. I love this picture, don't you? And it requires going within because this is just a costume that we all wear. So where's your focus from, from moment to moment? You get to choose, be flexible, be gumby. And just realize that being with sleepy people is an energetic thing that can actually cause constriction in us. So be sure to clear the gunk that collects on your light regularly, all right? And you can do that with meditation, with the 10 minute transformation meditation on my website, a beautiful way to clear the gunk out by reading uplifting things every day. This is the gifts page on my website. There are many beautiful teachers out there and your heart will tell you what will help you to remain awake. One of the best ways is turn off the television. Read the headlines, maybe watch them for a few minutes, but don't get sucked into the drama. See it for what it is, mostly a bunch of sleepy people. With that higher witness perspective, you'll be able to make higher choices and find peace. Okay? So, just remember this. True success comes from aligning with your true nature. The goal is contentment. That is ongoing no matter what is happening. Satisfaction is temporary and comes with being human. I'm wrapping this up now, so stay with me. Just a few more here. Satisfaction is temporary. It goes with the human side. It's short-lived, up and down. You're always wondering what's next. It's all about doing, 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 getting, getting. It, ha it has to do with the ego. But when you're content, that's a stable presence. You're focused on what's here and now and what's in here. You understand what it means to just be. Contentment arises naturally from the soul. It's ongoing. So just realize in a physical body, you are the light. The body is the instrument like this flute that Hafiz, the 13th century poet spoke of when he said, I am a hole in the flute that the Christ's breath moves through. That's spirit. This instrument is the vessel for the light to shine through you. How sweet is your song? A spiritual practice could consist of any of these, but when it consists of most of these, you will find yourself aligned most of the time. Train your mind to be quiet, practice presence or meditation regularly. Be on the alert for sleepy behavior in yourself. When you see it in others, instead of judging it, notice it and be awakened yourself. Send compassion and love instead of judgment. Read uplifting words every day. That's what my daily way will help you with or other things like the daily word. 
be the presence of love, that unconditional love from the light within. Maintain communion with higher consciousness, your guides. How do you do that? Any time throughout the day. Check in with them. Is there anything I need to know now? How am I doing today? Help me with this challenge, please. That's praying ceaselessly, maintaining constant spiritual awareness. When you do that, you are living the awakened way. So we'll just wrap this up. Awakening, a definition of awakening that was given to me by my guides that rings so true in the heart is going from an emptiness that can't be filled, that cold pit in the heart and the gut that so many are familiar with, that feeling of separation, going from an emptiness that can't be filled to a fullness that can't be contained. I know what my life felt like before I understood any of this, before I was gifted with the fruits of the spirit that arose from the worst day of my life when my stepdaughter passed. But that wake up call was transformational. And I know many of you have had that wake up call. My goal is that by being the light, you and I, others don't have to have that kind of wake up call, that your very radiance will have such an effect on others that we change the world. But don't worry about changing the world. The world is evolving perfectly because it's in good hands, right? It's all the light, all having an experience. At the deepest level, all is always in perfect order. Today's message from the Daily Way. You are truly magnificence itself. I hope that this has just allowed you to sit in that awareness for a little over two hours today, but to carry it forth with maybe just a little few more insights to carry you to the next insight on your ongoing journey. I love you all so much. I am so grateful that you are joining Bev and me and Lynette and my whole team and Ty on this amazing journey. It's not always easy, but it becomes so much easier as we awaken and realize we have always been the light. And as spirit reminds us daily, you are so very loved. Thank you so much. Blessings. Thank you.